Good morning. Um, commercial exploitation of heritage is a long story in the, in the field of heritage management, and we have the examples of the British and French explorers that went to Mesopotamia and to the other places in the Near East to get the stuff and artifacts for the British Museum and the Louvre. We have here Belzoni, which has gone to Egypt to take all of these artifacts, and these artifacts paid a lot of money in European markets. But underwater, we have the gold and the silver, and from this long expansion of maritime history that stretches from millennia, uh, these treasure hunters will target a very stretch, a very narrow margin of this maritime history. And they are mainly plundering the um, Portuguese and Spanish ships, which were the ones that were carrying gold and silver on board of them for the 300 years that went from the age of the discoveries till the 19th century. We have a lot of examples of um, mainly Anglo-Saxonic treasure hunters plundering all of these Iberian ships. And the first example we have in Portugal happened one month after the revolution of April the 25th, 1974, when the Belgian diver Robert Stenui went to Treasure Island, that so-called Porto Santo in Madeira Archipel, and he plundered the shipwreck site of the Slot Ter Hook, a Dutch VOC ship that sunk while going to Batavia. And uh, we have uh, the example of John Letterbridge, which was spoken earlier, and of Robert Sternui plundering all the gold and the silver, and even a chest full of uh, silver ingots. Nothing remains in Portugal of this treasure because all of it was sold in auctions. The only ingot bar that still remains in Portugal was bought by Portugal in an auction. Portugal tried to contest this uh, treasure hunting venture in the courtroom, but the Netherlands had considered this treasure divers, uh, hunter, uh, the um, prerogative to, to salvage the ship, so nothing was done. This is Robert Marx, he was spoken about earlier on, and in 1992 he went to Portugal and he kind of taught someone to pass a law that was the treasure hunting law, and uh, we fought it, uh, me, Francisco, and Philip Castro, which is now in Texas A&M, and we even made it to the UNESCO career in 1997, if I'm not mistaken. We have tried to get an alternative uh, to his ventures in Portugal, so we invited Texas A&M to, to come to the Azores and teach us how to do archaeology. Robert Mark was not pleased. There is a lot of profanity in these letters that were addressed to Texas A&M professors. But treasure hunting is a very large business. There was this loophole in the internal revenue system in the United Kingdom that basically gave a lot of money from um, the high fantasy circles to these treasure hunting ventures. And uh, we are talking here about offshore money, we are talking here about laundering money. And all of these companies, we have for instance Odyssey, and we have uh, Blue Water Recoveries, and we have uh, Archeonautas, we're all trying to get into the scheme of having been funded to go and do uh, deep water or even medium water surveys. We will hear about what happened with Odyssey of Spain. We will see what happened with the General Abatucci wreck, which was recovered by Blue Water Recoveries and Pascal Kainik. And it was sold in auctions, and part of it is now integrating some museums like the Charleston Shipwreck Museum. And then my uh, friend, Count, uh, German Count Nikolaus von Sandizel, which in 1991 um, created a company for treasure hunting in Portugal, and he invited this admiral from the Portuguese Navy, which basically says that we cannot be bothered by recovering worthless artifacts we are only concerned about gold and silver. Everything else we are going to leave down there. 
And then uh, you will see by the registration of this company that they are dedicating themselves to the recovery of shipwrecks. They have a lot of investors. They are mainly from the elite financials, uh, cream de cream, in Portugal, in Switzerland, in the United Kingdom. And they invited one of these famous archaeologists, Dr. Margaret Rue. And uh, when they could not go into Portugal because we managed to repeal the law in 1996, they took the whole outfit and went into the Cape Verde Islands. They made a project. As you will see, they enticed their divers, saying that uh, everything that we are going to be recovered is uh, worth a lot of money, so please don't ponder anything for yourselves. And then they sent these letters for their investors, mainly stating name and year of loss of ships and the total estimate of those ships in US dollars. So obviously they were not at all interested in archaeology. They were only interested in making money out of it. They had a Cape Verdean auditor on board, uh, as in all countries with a fragile capacity for humanities or for science. Uh, this person was a diver. He, he, he wrote a book about it, and it is basically tells it like it is, that they were not doing archaeology at all. And this is a fine example of what can happen in a treasure hunting venture. One day, one diver was swimming over a known wreck and he found this astrolabe that was made by a Portuguese astrolabe maker and it was bathed in silver. Um, the government of Cape Verde said, we want that astrolabe because it's a, new, a unique artifact. And the guys from the Archeonautas said, yes, why not? We'll just, so, oh, sorry, I'm going backwards. Here we go. The Cape, Verde, the Cape Verde government said, we want the astrolabe. And the guy said, well, you can have it if you pay for it. But you said in the contract that we were going to get, you know, the replaceable and unique artifacts. And they said, well, we do it when we have a profit. And we have been operating for 17 years, always in the red. So if you pay us for everything that we have lost investing into this recovery, then we are going to give you the astrolabe. And the Cape, Ger the Cape Verdean government said, well, we don't, cannot afford it. So they tried to sell it to Portugal. Portugal said, no, we are not buying anything from this unethical excavation. And then, of course, they went to Sotheby's. So the government of Cape Verde was forced to export it in order to pay the company with its own heritage. See, you, are, you have an African country which is giving away its heritage in order to go to first world uh, um, collectors. Actually, it went to America. So the Mariners Museum was missing an astrolabe. It didn't have one. So he bought it in an auction. When the guy said, well, maybe it's not a, a ethical to buy it from his. Margaret Rule, the archaeologist in charge, said, no problem, I'll vouch for it. So, when the Advisor Council on Underwater Archaeology questioned the museums, well, they squirmed and they said, well, maybe, maybe not. But this is one of the dangers. When you have a state that makes a contract with an unethical company, it's always very difficult to tell that it's not ethical to buy stuff. This is not the position that the United States Navy has. So when this company worked on the US yes, Yorktown, which is an American Navy ship that was doing an anti-slavery uh, patrol and got wrecked in the Cape Verde, the Department of Justice of the United States of America issued letters to Manson Bound, which was also working with Archonauts, to Mary Rose and to the company and to the auctioners, which were, so to speak, demanding to cease everything that they were doing and to return all the artifacts that had been illegally taken from an American ship, although it was situated in Cape Verdean waters. And in this case, the Department of Justice had a lot of weight, and they did it. 
When they ceased their operations in Cape Verde, they went to Mozambique. They forged an alliance with this guy, that is bold guy there. He's a general. He was an ancient deserter from the Portuguese Air Force. So he flew uh, during the guerrilla warfare. He flew his uh, Portuguese Air Force uh, plane into Tanzania, and he joined the ranks of Frelimo, which is now the government, still the government in Mozambique. And then he rose in the ranks. He became a general for Frelimo, and then a minister of defense, and then the head of the Secret Service of Mozambique. So they quite diplomatically joined rank and effort with this person, and they made a joint venture between Mozambique and this uh, treasure hunting company with the help of the Portuguese heir to the, um, to the Portuguese crown, and a lot of investors that are basically who's who in Portugal finances. So they made a public contract, which was not public, uh, this had a lot of uh, um, contest in the, in the Mozambican newspapers. They plundered all the wrecks. So they basically did what they did in Cape Verde. They took all the valuable stuff out of it, issued some investors' letters, and they, of course, went into the media because you can only find investors when you appear in the media. And when you have gold and silver and pirate lore, you are bound to find yourself into that media. So they issued a lot of um, artifacts for auctions, and uh, they moved their venture into Indonesia, into Brazil, and into Vietnam. And what they're trying to do, what they tried to do, and they did it, was that they went one step further, because when you look at the panorama about 20 years ago, you will see that UNESCO Convention is having an effect. They are feeling that they cannot operate anymore without constraints, so they have to find their way to navigate into the legal scenario that is narrowing even more for them. So they will try to uh, get arrangements with museums, like they did with the Lodgeberg Museum in Germany, which I know for a fact they imported into their smuggled artifacts out of Indonesia, which is illegal. And then they tried to get into this so-called archaeological or pseudo-archaeology scenario, which is publication. So they did reports. As you can see, this is a report from um, uh, Indonesian. And you will see it was plagiarized from Wikipedia word by word, and uh, this was done by a guy that says that he was a, a nautical archaeologist, when in fact he's a Cuban marine archaeologist, which has worked with Fidel Castro at Carisu. Um, they tried to sell this adventurous image of going treasure hunting, doing archaeology, saving, I, I, I love this one, saving the world maritime heritage, and so they promoted that foundation. As you can see, they will have more markets, including UNESCO Convention signatory countries. They now have this foundation, which is now um, in Amsterdam, in the Netherlands. And so they tried to went even more corporate. And what happened is that they uh, signed this deal with um, a very high-end clothing company where they would get 300,000 euros per year just to sell the brand of their name to the clothing line and one euro per each garment that they sold. So we are talking a lot of money here. So when I went to uh, one uh, radio station in Africa together with my colleague from Mozambique, and we we'll told them what it is. This is not archaeology, this is treasure hunting. They sued me, so they took me into court, and uh, they sued me for libel and slander. And I think I am probably the first person to use the UNESCO Convention as a legal tool to defend myself in court. So the process took about two years. I'll tell you at the end how it ended up. The problem is that when I went to the San Juan Museum of the Sea in Puerto Rico, you will see these navigational dividers, and they are from a ship plundered by Archonautas in Cape Verde. 
you have the whole collection there. You have treasure salvers. You have, uh, I think this is from the Atocha, also from Florida. You have the proverbial Titanic coal piece. And then you have, of course, the uh, forget about IT and the stab mission there. They have the authentic uh, uh, fastener and the piece of timber from the Santa Maria of Columbus. What is interesting is that this museum, which has a lot of pieces taken from these uh, plundered sites, has been commended by the national or the local commission of UNESCO as of exceptional importance which reminds us that if the archaeologists are not telling like it is, if you have to do the walk and you have to talk the talk, nobody else is going to do it. And these guys can come up and say, oh, we are wonderful archaeologists, although they have not a single archaeologist inside their midst. They only have guys from marketing, lawyers and lawyers, and people that are living off their investors' money. So when you have stuff like the Colombia the galleon, like the San Jose, you have to speak up. When you have that shipwreck that went on in Oman, uh, you have to speak up. When the Sultanate of Oman is doing this wonderful job of trying pr to preserve a common heritage between Portugal and Oman, you have to step in and tell it like it is. So, when still the Spanish universities invite Robert Stenui to go there and give a talk, you are preserving the farce. You have to know that when I was acquitted by the courtroom on a lower court and then they appealed and we went to a higher court and I was again acquitted, we have won a major victory. When Spain goes to court and prevents that their Spanish ships are being plundered, we are winning victories. And all of these 25 years of fighting treasure hunters have led me to believe that although you might have Kevin Costner as an Archinotus partner selling clothing that promotes the adventure and thrill of salvaging the maritime world heritage, or having them playing a gig promoting their stuff, you can do a lot more than that. And I took a bunch of my friends from archaeology and we wrote this German group and asked them, do you think that what you are doing is ethical? Helping to plunder African countries of their heritage to sell them to first world consumers. Three months later, their millionaire contract was terminated. That doesn't get me a lot of friends. I had a lot of death threats. I was taken to court. And I can resume my experience of 25 years like this. Know your facts. It will help you when you get to court. Know your sites. Know your treasure hunters. I have an affection by my treasure hunters. Associate with yourselves. Everyone has to associate. We have to create a network, an informal one, of archaeologists all around the world. Educate everyone. Go to kindergarten schools, go to the press, do whatever you can. Go up. We went to the Portuguese parliament together with my colleague from Mozambique, and we are pushing for a criminalization of anything that happens against underwater culture heritage. That means that any Portuguese citizen that is implied into plundering into Mozambique, although it might be legal there, it's not legal according to Portuguese law because we are going to push for the Article 15 to go into our own law. And this is going very well right now. Go down, go to the divers, go to the fishermen, go to the people that are every day, every day at sea. Speak up, come here, Come to the press, go to court, speak what you know about. Never compromise. There is archaeology and there is treasure hunting, and you cannot mix the facts. Be ethical, and there are no gray areas in heritage management. Like my colleague from Bahamas was saying, you cannot have a blessed marriage between treasure hunting and archaeology. 
You are either light or you are darkness. Please be light. Thank you.